Hello and welcome to The Pulse. In part two of this week's show, the perhaps not-so-strange disappearance of pro-democracy books from Hong Kong's biggest bookstore chains, which happen to be controlled by mainland companies. And we look at whether the current administration is finding new and ingenious ways of having its own way. This month, legislators rejected the setting up of an innovation and technology bureau tipped to be headed by Nicholas Yang. Two weeks later, the chief executive appointed him innovation and technology advisor. And then there's the case of the 3.1 billion of government expenditure that's now been removed from the oversight of the Finance Committee. First, though, the most recent example of the bypassing of LegCo. On Tuesday, the Executive Council gave the green light to building a third runway at Chetlatkop Airport. The project will cost over $141 billion and has been described as Hong Kong's third white elephant, along with the High Speed Rail Link and the Hong Kong Macau Zhuhai Bridge. Legislative councillors had no say on whether the project got the go ahead. Fatin 102架次的飛機升降量,即是每年62萬的架次,這個容量的目標. The mega project occupying about 650 hectares of land will be reclaimed from the sea. It is still facing a judicial challenge from environmentalists. The airport authority stated that the cost of construction will increase by $7 billion if building the runway is delayed by a year. The authority's self-financing plan consists of drawing on its own capital, external borrowing and charging passengers a levy of around $180. Because public funds are not being requested, this project will bypass the Legislative Council's vetting process. Nevertheless, the authority will stop paying annual dividends to the government of about $50 billion over the next 10 years thus reducing the amount available for public spending. Two former aviation directors lash out at the expansion plan. They say that issues of limited airspace and traffic congestion at five Pearl River Delta region airports are aggravated by strict controls on allocation of airspace imposed by the Chinese military. They maintain that these issues need to be resolved before considering the construction of a third runway. The airspace over the Pearl River Delta area is very, very crowded. Actually, I could illustrate this with an example. Guangzhou Airport opened their third runway just a month ago. And you know what happened? They could only increase 10 flights a day because they couldn't send the aircraft into the crowded air airspace. Um, and in view of this, Guangzhou Airport has actually dropped the original idea of building the fourth and the fifth runways. With us in the studio are Michael Mo, spokesperson of the Airport Development Concern Network, and Sin Chung Gai of the Democratic Party. Sin Chung Gai, can I come to you first in the unusual position of defending a government decision? But what, why fundamentally do you support the government's plan for a th third runway? I think, uh, you know, there are complexity demand, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, we need to have uh, ex to expand our capacity to meet the future demand. Uh, you know, some set suggest a third runway, some suggest, you know, a, a new airport. You know, after so many years, I think we need to have a decisions. And I think, of course, we need to clear, you know, the environmental issues, the financial issues, and of course, the aviation control. Uh, uh, the secretary You're talking about the airspaces. Yeah, the yes. airspaces, not only the land, but also in particular, you know, the airspace uh, restrictions, uh, you know. Uh, the assurance uh, have to be given by the government, not only by Hong Kong government, but also by Beijing's government in the days to come. I think, you know, uh, although uh, the Secretary for Transport and Housing have reiterated uh, 
uh, if it rated uh, their their position that the 2007 framework has al uh, has already included third runway and their air capacity demand, uh, but I think you know more uh, more uh, document more disclosures of the framework sh is necessary to clear the, you know the various of the. I public. mean, are you are you confident that that is in fact the case? Because in in an, in in yesterday's statement and an article by Anthony Chung, the minister responsible, he seemed to be suggesting well, this, this is still a, under discussion. This is a chicken and egg issues. You know, if Hong Kong does not make a decision, then, you know, further ass assurance or further clearance from Beijing could not, be could not be done. I think, you know, Hong Kong should take a first step and then make a clear position. And then, you know, we, you know, this is a lengthy process. You know, we need to have further assurance. But, uh, you know, uh, without the first step, uh, you know, move, then that cannot be taken. Michael Moe, can I come to you? I, I, I think the issue of, of demand is not in question. I think your group also agrees that demand will increase. Well, demand is there, but then we have seen that the airport authority and the civil aviation department themselves have done, you know, have not done their job to increase our airport capacity back to the basics. I mean, the 1992 airport master plan design, and we don't see that, you know, in 20 years, almost 20 years, the airport has been, you know, put in place, and it hasn't been done. You but what, w what is your solution? If the demand is there, how is it going to be met? Well, if the airspace issue has been resolved, we don't need a third runway in a very you know, short period of time because you know, we could clear the airspace, we could have more flights with our current two runways. If there's a is real... That, is that really true? I mean, well, with, with air safety standards having gone up in the years since those runways were built? Yes, of course. You know, mm. even the airport consultant, uh, they are the same actually, the same consultant of 1992 and 2007, you know, and we, we're seeing this, you know, five conflicting, you know, conclusion of this, so we don't know why. But then after we have investigated, we have seen that, you know, at not, um, not until we clear the airspace issue, you know, nothing would improve, even we build a third run. Okay, so in the short term, you're saying existing capacity could be more fully utilized yes and in the long term what in the long term we should investigate whether you know we need a new airport somewhere else where we have a clearer skies further away from the you know already congested airspace in the river delta and that would be where that would be the airport authorities consultant has once suggested that you know one options would be in the southern land town to reclaim the land right there and the airport right there would be more efficient than third runway proposal. Well, Sintram Guy, what, what, what do you think about that? I think that has been uh, that has been an issue a couple of years ago. I think you know in 2011, uh, the government started to narrow down the current proposal of the third runway. I think uh, you know if we went back a couple of years ago, you know then you know the uh, the demand we have to turn away the demand in the next uh, couple of years. In fact, you know, uh, even in 2009, the then report suggested, you know, we will reach, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the capacity in 2020. But, you, but, you, but the you reality... You don't accept the argument that existing capacity could be more fully utilized. But there are definitely... Op well, the 1992, it is a master layout design plan. Uh, but, 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 you know, subsequent to that, you know, the, the current operational uh, a capacity, you know, the government have been, you know, the, the aviation department and the government have been, you know, pushing. It is now currently 66 uh, per hours, but you know, uh, with uh, further further uh, uh, smoothing out of the operation, the, they said that, that the limit is to 68. I and thought uh, the limit was supposed to be 80. Is it not? That is the operation. That is the master layout plan. 88, mm. 88. The master layout plan, uh, 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 ideal. Well, in uh, back into 1992. Well, um, where do we go from here then? I mean, um, Sintrung Guy doesn't seem to think this is a, a, a realistic prospect of, of extending capacity as it is. The thing is that the 1992 proposal has assumed that the airspace, you know, at the north of the airport can be fully utilized by Hong Kong. And right now, it's clearly not the case. If we've got the assurance from the, you know, whether it's from Beijing or whether it's from Shenzhen, we could already increase our airport capacity without building a new runway. 
What do you think? I mean, surely there must be alternatives. This is a very controversial plan. It is. I think uh, well, the government should uh, uh, further explain uh, in the council or to the public and disclosing more about the framework in the 2007 agreed by the Beijing and uh, you know, the nearby authorities. Well, let's see if that happens. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we'll be back after the break. Welcome back. In part one, we looked at government strategies to avoid LegCo having a say in the construction of the airport's third runway. It's not the only such attempt. Earlier this week, the Finance Committee discussed the way that the government has withdrawn 25 items, costing an estimated $3.1 billion from its consideration. They did this by putting these items directly in the budget with the intention of getting it passed as a package with minimal scrutiny of individual items. Critics say this shows yet again the desire of the chief executive and his administration to ride roughshod over LegCo rules and procedures. For the Democrats, the filibuster is a way to fight back against a system in which the decks are stacked against them. For the government, it's just a case of more tiresome delays. This year as last, these strategy games are continuing, with the government repeatedly scheduling pet projects for LegCo's consideration and approval before allowing councillors to vet other livelihood issues. One such pet project, the setting up of an innovation and technology bureau, was recently rejected. However, the chief executive went ahead and made Nicholas Young his innovation and technology advisor. But that's not the only battle. On Monday, claiming filibusters caused too many delays, the Financial Services and Treasury Bureau said it would remove 25 items involving some 3.1 billion of public money from the oversight of the Finance Committee. They'll now be incorporated into the budget's estimates of expenditure. This includes a $290 million fisheries development loan fund. Lipo,Lipo,等于范文,已经是社会的共识,在这种状况之下,政府法律法律容许之下,去转线,我觉得没问题。我见得到呢,就是我们现在的议会呢,是不堪的。不堪呢,就是我们连那个传统,我们遵
doesn't want them to read. Meanwhile, even Hong Kongers are sometimes finding it hard to get hold of some of those contentious titles, particularly from the large mainland-backed book chains. Even while protesters were still occupying the streets of Admiralty, Mong Kok and Causeway Bay, books and magazines focusing on the umbrella movement were beginning to appear. Many more have come out since. Some supported the protests, others have opposed them, taking the official line of the Hong Kong and Beijing governments. But while many books supporting the movement were initially highly popular, would-be readers have found it increasingly hard to get hold of them. They've been disappearing from the shelves of Hong Kong's largest book chains, simply because there is not enough stock of these books. Last week, Up Publications held a clearance sale for stock returned by the three chain bookstores owned by the China-funded Sino United Publishing Group. And normally the books, those unsold copies, will be returned in about a year time. To answer your questions, how many copies do we have been... Uh, returned so far, uh, a few hundreds, and that is, that is kind of un uh, unexpected. Sino United Publishing is one of the largest publishing conglomerates in Hong Kong. The three chain bookstores it operates dominate the retail market. The very same books that the pro-Beijing chains downplay or reject are good business for independent bookstores. Many customers come into these smaller shops specifically to find the books the pro-Beijing chains claim do not sell. Many buyers even come from the mainland. The sales is exceptional comparing with our ordinary titles. Uh, normally we sell books around like 40 or 50 if they are some of our best sellings, but uh, now we are seeing the figures around two to three hundreds at least for the books on the movement. Particularly popular are books containing interviews with protesters or written by pro-democracy authors, and they would probably enjoy even bigger sales if the big chains were not making it hard to see them. When it comes to titles Beijing might regard as contentious, the mainland backed bookstores tend to order only some 10% of what they would normally order from these book publishers. This publisher is known for books that initially appeared online, such as Lost on a Minibus to Typo and Due West. These books did not encounter the same problems with the chain bookstores. Meanwhile, the books on the protests that the chains do feature prominently reflect the official Beijing line as firmly as the pages of Da Gongbao and Wen Weibo. This one claims to be an objective analysis of the Occupy movement, but it echoes the Beijing and Hong Kong government view that the protests were an attempt at a colour revolution funded and backed by external forces. This book by Yu Fei, whose commentaries sometimes appear in Dagon Pao, has been criticised for getting its facts wrong. Yu Fei, for example, accused the Independent Commentators Association for receiving funding from the US-based NGO, the National Endowment for Democracy, something the association flatly denies. This false statement will give the public a wrong impression that our association may be altered by um, other external funding, uh, which in our establishment we emphasize that we won't accept any external funding um, overseas. The group sent a legal letter asking for a correction and an apology. It set a deadline for Wednesday this week, but the author has not responded. However, this book has high-profile supporters. The Chinese Association of Hong Kong and Macau Studies, chaired by the former Chinese official Chen Zuo, has backed it on its website. First, they want to sell the policy well, the nice to take or the tunes well, of the Beijing government. Yeah. Second, they want to dominate the media uh, uh, as well as to overshadow the opposition forces. 
To combat increased attempts to restrict freedom of choice for publications, students at the Chinese University of Hong Kong this week held a protest against censorship. They say the right to choose should rest with readers. Not only do some mainlanders buy them from independent bookstores and publishers to take back home, but sales can be boosted by a word of condemnation from officials, including the chief executive. In the wake of Mr Leung's criticism of the Hong Kong nationalism anthology in his policy address, not only did it start flying off the shelves, a further print run was needed. He helped a relatively obscure book to become a bestseller. And that's it for this week. Don't forget, if you've missed part of the show, want to see more episodes or even see it again, you can go to the RTHK website. You can even chat to us on our Facebook page, RTHK's The Pulse. We'll see you at the same time next week. Goodbye.